I think so. Okay. So we see inside Elsbeth's office, uh, specifically the painting above her desk, uh, wholly unblurred and unmodified now for the first time you guys are, are seeing this. Uh, we're, we're kind of in the abstract seeing this, and if, if anything, this would be mostly through uh, Peter's uh, third eye. Uh, you see seven adults on this painting, uh, wearing these resplendent gray uniforms, uh, and a small child with a beaming smile. Uh, there's an elven woman who looks very much like you, Navara, uh, and she has an arm around Jack, and they're both smiling. And Navara, you are in front and center frame, and you're kind of cheesing it for this picture. Uh, Kitas, you and Drew are standing side by side, and you've got your shirt sleeves kind of rolled up, and you're laughing and, and flexing, kind of striking a pose. Uh, Peter, you're standing behind them, uh, holding the small blonde girl over your shoulder, kind of piggyback style. And in the middle of this, this crew, uh, with the same cautious smile that you've seen, seen hanging over her office for a year now, is Elsbeth, and she's holding her journals. Uh, two separate journals, uh, surrounded by her friends. And you can see the eight of you celebrating this rare moment of peace and happiness during this harrowing journey. Uh, and it's time to remember this moment now, that that uh, all the others that brought you to where you are today, it's time to reclaim the, the, the gap of time that you've been missing. Um, Kitas, the door to the director's private chamber has just opened. So the music levels will be a little bit off until I dial this back in again. Um, uh, the short distance here was fraught with horror. There was bodies of co-workers, even some friends that were cut down in the hallways. Uh, Faith, the, the spirit that's inside the robot left by Oliver, is panically pointing out where the Hunger's invisible shadow creatures are, and you and Carrie are doing your best to cut them down, but you're both taking cuts and stabs and nicks and all, from all directions from attackers that you can't see. Uh, you're both covered in so many tiny wounds that the blood pooling under your armor is starting to stick, uh, turn sticky and hamper your movement. Uh, the door is just now opened. Uh, you see on a dais in the center of the room, you see Navara, Peter, Jack, and Drew all kind of semi-encircling Elsbeth. Uh, Elsbeth is leaning against her staff, and you see the Statera scales on the floor beside her, and there's a thin rivulet of this glowing white energy that is flowing out of the scales and into the staff. Uh, you notice that Drew has just dropped a small silver cup that was that is now rolling across the floor, uh, and he wipes this blue liquid from his lips with the back of his hand. And he says, Elsbeth, wh what have you done? And as he says this, uh, Carrie and Faith kind of step past you into the room. What are you doing? I will, I guess, go with him into the room. Okay, so you step inside. The, there's a wave of... There's there's half a dozen of these kind of shadowy creatures that are, that are chasing after you. Um, you Sorry, well, you can't see them, but you are you can hear them. You can kind of... You, you've uh, been carefully at times pointed to, you know, one's here, jump out of the way left, jump right, things like that from, from Faith, basically, who can see them. Um, and she is, you knew that you're being chased by a half dozen of these that are, that are following you in there. Um, and you hear the, these, and hear more than see, uh, these creatures kind of pouring in behind you into this room. Uh, Navarra, Peter, what are you guys doing? You guys can see them. You can see that these creatures are following in, and you can tell that Ketis does not see them. Um... I still have some of that water in my bag, right? Yeah, my, you you emptied your wine skin exactly and, and filled it. So. Okay, well, I guess I'll just try to get to Kitas and try to get him to drink it. Okay, uh, he's not far. I mean, it's 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 not that big of a room, so I mean, you can get straight to him um, and, and hand it to him. So you you rush over to him and, and uh, Kitas, she she kind of shoves this wine skin into your hand. What are you doing? Ask her. What is it? Good. You'll find out. Just drink it. <laughs> okay, I'll drink it. All right, you have to throw Ruin uh, up over your back or, or drop it or throw it to your offhand. Uh, you wouldn't be able to use your shield, but uh, basically you kind of take a second to, to chug this stuff down. It's it's viscous and it doesn't taste good, um, but I mean, it, it's uh, you know the, a similar taste. You, you've remembered this before. It's not something that's new to you. Uh, it has been you know a couple of years now since you drank it before, a year, actually a little over a year. Um, but you chug this stuff down, um, and this flood of, of information begins to kind of take over. And this is something you, you were expecting and, and knew was coming, and you also, saw on some level, knew that this would reveal these things to you uh, that, that have been chasing you this whole time. Um, and for simplicity's sake, uh, we are going to come back to this, and, and it's going to be a little while. I just want you guys to remember this scene as it was occurring right there. Basically, Kitas has just come into the room. Uh, Drew has just drunk from this stuff. Jack, uh, Navara, and Peter, you guys have all, you already knew what was going on here, and now you've kind of gotten Peter into the fold as well. So it's now the five of you. Uh, Carrie and Faith are still standing nearby, but they have not drunk from it. But the five of you are kind of surrounding uh, half-circle around Elsbeth. 
um, as she's trying to channel something out of the Statera scales and into her staff. Um, and that scene we will be coming back to, but it's going to be a little while. So just don't forget that scene. I'll, I'll remind you, of course, when, when it comes up. Um, but it's going to be a little bit before we get back to there because what we're doing now is going to be what this last arc is, and this will make sense here in just a minute, but uh, back to the narrative here. Uh, that was the day before the hunger came. Uh, but before that day, before that crisis, before Wonderland, before the time-sick town, before the Crystal Lab, the cart races, the trains, and the moon bases, before everything you've experienced, you and your friends had a journey beyond all imagination. Eight explorers lost their home to the same force that threatens us now. Their impossible trajectory carried the, them between wild, desolate, beautiful, and deadly worlds where they faced terrible hardships and immeasurable joy. They lived, they died, they loved, and in the end they forgot. But now it's time to remember and it's time to go back to where your story truly started because only then can we prepare for how it ends. Uh, there it is. It's fucking irritating that so many of these are different volume levels. It's a hundred years ago. Uh, Kitas, Navara, Peter, Yorith, Jack, Elspeth, and Drew. The seven of you are standing on a stage, each in these resplendent gray uniforms with a patch on the chest. You're standing in the dim light, almost dark, uh, in front of a massive crowd of cheering people. The sky above is a vibrant purple. Uh, one of your world's suns has set and the other is resting just above the horizon. Uh, it's evening time. Uh, a spotlight is shining on Emma, the always cheery PR lady for the IPRE, who is st the, the company you work for, uh, who is standing in front of you, addressing the crowd. Microphone in hand, she says, Everything begins, and I mean that almost literally, with the light of creation, apotheosis. Uh, imagine the power to realize anything your mind can conceive of on any scale, and then imagine that power given tangible form. It's not the whole being that created our universe, but it very well may be a small part of it, a shard, if you will. It's the paintbrush that illustrated the very first tree. It's the yardstick that told the stars where to hang in the sky. And somehow, apotheosis ended up in a place where it probably never intended to go. Our world the very world that it helped to shape. A year ago, the Institute of Planar Research and Exploration, the world's premier collective of bright minds and adventurous spirits, recovered the apotheosis. And in this past year, we've made immeasurable advances in the fields of science and arcana, all culminating in tomorrow's unprecedented voyage. Please give a warm welcome to our brave explorers. And the spotlight swings back and widens out to encompass all of you, and the crowd roars and cheers and applauds. And you see Drew step forward, but he almost doesn't even resemble the small meek man that you've come to know at the college. This Drew, Captain Drew, uh, actually, stands up straight-backed, proud, and confident, uh, with a charming smile and a positive attitude. He takes the microphone from the PR lady and he proclaims loudly... Oh, hang on. Oh. <laughs> and it proclaims loudly... Uh, is this thing on? Okay, cool. So, so yeah, our mission uh, to explore strange new worlds, it, it's gonna last, uh, I don't know, somewhere maybe about two months, give or take. We're going to fly in that thing over there, and he points off stage to where a huge tarp is frantically being yanked off of a gleaming silver airship by a dozen workers who obviously were not prepared for Drew's reveal just yet. Uh, he continues, It's called the Hermian Shoes. I know it's a retarded name, but you, you need to blame yourselves for that one because we left it up to a vote, and we came this close, and he kind of holds his fingers up like an inch apart, to gaining, going in this momentous, world-changing uh, undertaking uh, on an airship named the Shippy McShipface. So you dumbasses, the Hermian Shoes came in second. But dumb name or not, she's a marvel of modern arcane ingenuity, and she has eight cup holders. Yes, I counted. Uh, it is... Hang on. Whoops. God damn it. There you go. That's the name of the ship. He says, but back to the mission. Yeah, we plan on being gone for about two months. Uh, the shoes here ought to get us to the edge of the solar system in about 27 days. And then we're going to hang out, take selfies with some planets, uh, drink something alcoholic till we can't see straight, and then we're going to fly back. So I'm expecting you all to be good and take care of this planet while we're gone. You know, no parties, be home before dark, keep the doors locked, all that shit. But you guys behave and maybe we'll bring you back a present from deep space. Now, before they kick me off stage, let me in introduce my incredible crew. And he says, uh, our chief botanist and mediocre poker player, Ketis, uh, step on up here, my man. And he beckons you up to stand next to him. I will do so. He uh, kind of pats you on the shoulder heartily and then kind of wraps his arm around you. Uh, and our chief medical officer, Jack, and Jack walks up, kind of stands on the other side. Uh, he says, if, you know, if he kind of mumbled this, he says, if I get space measles and die, you'll know who to blame. Uh, and our chief arcano mechanical engineer and one of the designers of the Alcubierre drive that made all this possible, Yorith. And she runs up and, and steps next to Jack. 
And he says, uh, and for our next contestant, uh, relax, no, you're not seeing double. It's just her twin sister and our fantastic chief biologist, Navara. Okay, step forward. And next up is our chief communications officer, Elsbeth. Uh, and you see a youthful, exuberant, and smiling Elsbeth step up beside her. Uh, she, she's carrying two heavy journals, one clasp in each hand, kind of kind of in front of her. Um, uh, and, and you notice, keep in mind that, that we're, oh, I guess this will make more sense in a little bit. Basically, we're going to be playing through that gap of time that you guys were missing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sarko? Yep. Okay. So we're going to be playing through that. So it will be happening... Uh, as opposed to being past tense, we'll be playing through it in present tense. There will be the important story points. I'll make sure that we still get through those, of course. But beyond that, you guys are going to have freedom to, even though this is the past, you'll have freedom to play through it as you know, as you see fit, as your characters would. Um, but you do recognize that as you, as these memories are kind of flooding into you, as you're still standing inside that dais room uh, surrounding Elspeth, um, the you recognize this version of her doesn't look like that version of her. That version is very stoic, uh, very standoffish and um, and professional. And here she just seems for, for maybe shy, but but certainly very happy and uh, uh, and present in the moment as opposed to being kind of reserved like you like you're used to seeing her. Um, and he says, uh, and last but mostly least, my right hand man, uh, first officer and chief navigator Peter. You step on up, Sako. I step on up. Uh, each of you roll a perception for me. Um, I would say Peter and Ivara both uh, in kind of as this as this memory. I would say that it isn't exactly flowing through both of you at the exact same time. You're not thinking of this memory at the exact same time as you're standing at the dais there with Elspeth, but uh, both of you do note that everything that has stood out about this, everything that you've learned up to this point before kind of regaining this memory has told you that there were eight, but there's only seven of you up here on stage. Um, you know, the, the, the seven that I read off earlier, but basically. Um, but there's apparently somebody still missing, as far as you can tell. Uh, Drew says, uh, so now that the introductions are out of the way, uh, how about we get to that Q&A? Uh, you folks have questions. We've got some vague and unsatisfying answers for you. Uh, and you see in the crowd that one of the gathered reporters kind of step up to the, the lone mic in the middle. And, and uh, he says, hi, I'm Reed from the Ludd Times. Uh, this question's for Navara. As an expert in the biological creatures of our planet, you recognize common evolutionary traits in predators like sharp teeth and claws, that kind of thing. How do you plan to study and interact with predatory creatures of exoplanets without putting yourselves in danger? Um. Well, I'm sure um. we're going to be in some danger. <coughs> Wait. Excuse me, I'm sure we're going to be in some danger. I can't think we can avoid it. Well, this was a question for Navara, so so <laughs> you, just, you could just step on back, <laughs> Mr. Botanist. I don't know if this, maybe, maybe there's some dangerous plants. Somebody else will ask you about dangerous plants. That's right. <laughs> well, since I have experience already with our dangerous animals, then... I'll just step back and watch them and try to keep everybody out of danger and learn what I can. Follow question then. Uh, any chance you'll be returning with any of these creatures? Probably not. <laughs> the, not he kind of dangerous. <laughs> he kind of he kind of says he kind of you know thanks and and uh, and nods and heads back and uh, you see another news person step up to the mic. There's a music cutting. Oh, I think Discord is. Blah. You guys hear? Is this music getting static for you guys all of a sudden? A little bit. Okay. Probably this Discord. I think it'll clear up. Uh, so another reporter steps up to the mic. He says, "Hi, I'm a uh, I'm, I'm Thumbprint, uh, and he's a, he's a real short little guy, like a uh, little halfling guy." Uh, from the Emerald City Gazette. Uh, this one is for Peter. Peter, I, I read that you have a master's in divination. Uh, what are you going to do if your far seeing doesn't line up with the mission plan? That's a great question. We've got people for that, and uh, <laughs> I, I have some amazing folks that work with me. They're huge, they're great, and uh, we're going to make sure that things are good. But what specifically, if you're, say you, you uh, in your divining, find that you guys should go left, but the mission plan says to go right, what's, what's the idea? 
I'll uh, I'll advise for the uh, for the divination plan. We'll stick with that. Got it. Got it. And he just thanks and uh, he kind of steps back. Uh, Fake news. <laughs> I was curious if you were trying to go with like a Trumpian kind of a response. Like we've got huge people for that. Uh, another one steps up. Uh, uh, this one just just a big heavy beard. Uh, he's a, a Wigruf uh, from the Red Rock Roost. Uh, for Kitas, uh hey bro, you you looking swole for the botanist? What's what's your secret? Uh, some of those plants when you eat them, they actually help you get big and like you know spinach. You know that'll definitely <laughs> get your forearms big. So I mean, that's what my that's my that's my trick. He's, uh, you notice that he's, like, scratching this down, like he's taking notes from your answer, like, forearms, got it, forearms is the key. <laughs> uh, fo- follow-up question for you there, Kitas. Uh, if you find some dank alien kush, will you bring me back a dime bag? Uh, yeah, sure. I, d- sure, I don't know what you mean, dank alien kush. What is this kush you're speaking of, sir? I would never partake in such things. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sneak some back for you, don't worry about it, buddy. You, you give him, like, a wink? Yeah. Um... So another reporter asks the question, uh, this time of Elspeth, uh, asking what her purpose on the mission will be since communication back home won't be possible. Uh, and she's supposed to be the chief communications officer. Uh, she replies that she's a biographer by trade and intends to uh, record the activities of the mission in detail, uh, like a historian, essentially, uh, for future generations to learn from. Uh, this continues on for a little while. There's kind of a question and answer uh, back and forth for a little while uh, until Drew pipes up. He says, uh, okay, folks, well, we've got time for one more question, so, so step up your game. Uh, and one final reporter just seeks her way up to the front, uh, asking uh, Yoris, she says, uh, why is it that you're choosing to go out there with all the risk that, that something could go wrong? And she says, uh, well, I, I kind of did this one already. I, I did this world and I, I just kind of crushed it. So I guess I'm excited for opportunity to expand the old brand, as it were. So yeah, I'm pretty psyched to get off this stink planet and see what's out there. And she steps away from the mic for a second, then she kind of, she stops. She just kind of stops in, in mid, uh, uh, you know, mid walk as she's stepping away. Uh, and then she kind of rushes back abruptly and grabs the mic, uh, uh, mic uh, and, and shouts. Also, before I forget, Greg Romaldus, you owe me $15 and I aim to collect. You better believe that, Greg Romaldus. And she drops the mic and walks away. Fucking uh, Greg. <laughs> the, the press conference comes to an end. Uh, Emma, the, the PR lady, and the IPRE uh, are corralling the crowd away from the Hermian shoes. Um, and this is part of the part that I told you you guys are going to have quite a bit of freedom when it comes to this arc uh, only because I don't have I, I don't, I'm not going to plan it all for you because it's, uh, so much of it is going to depend on what you guys choose to do with your time uh, so here we are though, the night before the mission that changes everything uh, you guys know that you won't be coming back here uh, your characters don't know that in the moment of course, uh, you do intend to be coming back in about two months or so uh, but Captain Drew, Elsbeth, Jack, and Yorth are all heading to a nearby bar that you guys often frequent, um, uh, that you, you know, often patronize. Uh, Yorth asks all of you if you'd like to go too, but you're welcome to go anywhere and do anything you'd like for your last night here on your home planet. What are you guys doing? Hmm. I don't know, I guess probably if there are any around, I'll say bye to family or whatever, if there is any close to where we are. Well, so you tell me there. Now, now I would say it this way, too. Keep in mind, for all three of you, uh, in no way am I removing or invalidating your guys' backstories. This will make sense later on, but the backstories that you guys had, which none of you had too much family to speak of or anything like that, you didn't have a lot of background hooks, um, but let's say that those are also correct, is how I'll say that. They're not... Uh, this this doesn't invalidate or change in any way your guys' backstories. Like for, for Navarra specifically, the memories of uh, being at the base of the tree, things like that, that, uh, you know, being abducted by Moro, those things all still happened uh, and still are part of your character's histories. Um, this is just uh, in addition to, I guess, is how I would explain that for now. But none of the three of you had any, uh, which is part of why this uh, works for this campaign, whereas your other campaigns, you guys have a little bit more uh, solid roots. Uh, you know, Kitas, if, if you had family here, then by all means, this, is, these are, this would be a family you didn't remember before. So if that's how he's spending his night, then, then that's, you know, he could be, you know, going off and just having dinner with family or something like that. Mm, well, maybe I'll just, no, because I don't want to change it. I just don't remember exactly what the backstory was, but I don't want to change it. So I guess I'll just hang out with the crew, I guess, if they're not doing anything. Get ready for the next day. Uh-huh. Talk about what we're doing. Well, the, the, at least the other four of the seven are headed off to the bar, um, to the bar that you guys often you know, normally go to. I but, will join. Okay. 
Navar, what are you what are you doing for your last uh, last night on your home planet? Well, I would assume Navar would actually probably want to spend some time out in nature since she's going to be stuck on a ship for a while. Mm. Sure. So what's she doing? Um, I guess just going to whatever her favorite spot would be just to kind of sit and relax out in nature and just enjoy it. Okay. Um, commuting, that kind of thing? Like just, uh, because, yeah. uh, keep in mind too, I, I didn't express this portion of it yet. Um, a few times during the level up process, and, and I made sure to do this recently specifically for Peter, because uh, Sako didn't hear the earlier parts of the, you know, because he joined in uh, a little later. Um, I made sure to point this out, but I, I didn't hit on it too hard because I didn't want it to give away what was happening. Um, I, I tried to point out often when you guys leveled up that it felt like you were um, uh, accelerating faster than you otherwise should have. Did you guys catch that? Yeah. Well, you always say yeah. that we're overpowered. Yeah, but, but it wasn't it, from a mechanical sense. I was explaining it specifically for Peter. I even explained it that, that he's uh, learning faster than he should. Do you remember that for, okay. for Sako? Sako, do you remember that? Yep, always. Okay. So what that was representing narratively was that you guys weren't learning things so much as you were remembering things. Part of your kind of muscle memory was... was Refiguring out how to cast things that you'd already been able to cast, or refiguring out how to do things you already knew how to do. Does that make sense? Is that where like the misty yeah. step came from? And the other exactly. step yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you weren't. It's not. It's not so much like you were learning new things as if you it's were relearning skills. Exactly. They they already okay. existed. You were just forced to forget them, and your body was kind of just remembering them on its own over time. Does that make sense? Yep. So the reason that's important is because uh, during this this arc here, uh, which is called the Stolen Century, by the way, here. Um, this arc here is um, you were already at twentieth level essentially by the uh, mechanically that's what we'll, how we'll describe it as. Um, but we're still going to continue leveling up normally. But basically, I'm not I'm not setting you guys back to level one or something like that to play this, even though it's in the past. It's basically throughout this whole last you know two years, three years that it's been um, since you you know were forced to forget. You've just been kind of relearning these things over again. Hence the accelerated uh, uh, leveling process, if that makes sense. So basically, you'll still have all of your abilities and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you're not starting from from you know level one because this is in the past. Uh, so, anyways, as far as the uh, what what Navarra is doing, she's already a an extremely accomplished and very advanced. Uh, all uh, you guys won't be twentieth. In fact, we're going to start this around eighteenth, so we're probably going to bump you up a couple levels here uh, in the next uh, session or two um, to get you to eighteen, and then you'll be at twenty by the end, of course. Uh, but basically, you're already extremely powerful, uh, almost unmatched for your capabilities, which is part of why you were chosen to go on this mission in the first place. Um, so, you know, uh, Navarro's connection with nature is already very deep and, and, uh, and significant, and, and her presence is vital for uh, the natural world uh, and, and places where, you know, where she goes would, um, the natural world would respond very much to her presence in those cases. So, um, specifically, she's going out into, you know, into the woods or something to just commune with nature and that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Um... In in so doing, knowing that this is going to be your your last night here for a little while, though again you expect to be back within a couple of months, but uh, your last chance to be kind of in in nature of a place that you feel comfortable, I guess is how I'd say it, um, because you may be you know in a natural world that is alien to you and, and would take time to become comfortable in. Um, you uh, wade yourself carefully into. In fact, you you probably. Um, uh, you know, turn yourself into you know a, a giant eagle and float, fly deep into the woods somewhere, so it's not just walking distance, but somewhere far, far away where you know there's no civilization to be found anywhere nearby, um, and set yourself down into a clearing uh, and call all of the, the the nearby natural creatures to come uh, and just you know, for for lack of a, a better descriptor, just hang out essentially just nearby. Um, those that are you know in in uh, uh, that ecosystem all come. Uh, predators and prey all sitting near each other, just kind of gathering around you while you uh, uh, spend your spend a, a small 
uh, ritualistic preparation for this to grow um, at the beginnings of a tree that you intend to come back to later um, and, and you know, kind of continue to feed until it grows into something huge. Um, but you kind of begin to, to grow this, this tree up out of the ground in this clearing um, that will eventually, you intend, of course, kind of encompass the surrounding area, uh, giving this, you know, this massive canopy while all these animals just uh, kind of frolic around and, and very Bambi-esque uh, hang out and not trying to eat each other. Um, but you spend your evening kind of very peacefully and, and uh, uh, kind of preparing this, this what you expect to be this massive um, uh, peaceful monument to the, the expansion of species um, in, in the natural world here. Um, but you, you know, spend it a, a very peaceful, easily, uh, easy evening um, before you kind of prepare to, to turn back, uh, meditating through portions of it so that you're, you know, not exactly wiped out the next day. You don't exactly need as much sleep as, as the, the human members of your crew. Um, but you kind of go, go through that uh, nice, easy evening and prepare to head back in the morning. Uh, Peter, what are you doing for the for the evening? You heading to the bar with uh, with Kitas and the rest of the crew, or doing something different? Yeah, I'll be heading to the bar with uh, with the crew, uh, but I'll probably partake of of any mind expanding uh, partakeness. Push. Yeah, uh, Push to uh, just kind of kind of relieve the stress from what's about to happen because I know okay. I'm going to be locked on a ship for two months. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so you then, I guess it's everybody that is not uh, Nivara because she wanted to feel antisocial. Um, the rest of you, <laughs> which of course is in character for, for, you know, somebody that doesn't feel comfortable in, uh, you know, a social environment that's, uh, packed with that number of people anyways. Um, the rest of you guys head off to, uh, to, to the nearby bar though. Um, it's, it, although it's by title a bar, it, it's a very, normally a very organized, uh, neat kind of environment. It's not dim lighting. It's not, uh, people getting drunk and falling off of bar stools. It's, you know, generally... Uh, almost clinical, um, but there's a certain kind of raucous nature in this room tonight just because everybody that's in here, it's not just the seven of you or the six of you, um, there's, you know, the bar is, is packed because the reporters and the other people, the other members of the IPRE, everybody's kind of preparing for the following day and they know, one, what the risks are, of course, that it could be a very, you know, terrifying day. Uh, could be there could be a major disaster. Who knows? This is the first time that that uh, you know this species, your people, not just species, but your people, um, have ever made this kind of an attempt. But but more than that, that even if everything goes smoothly, this is the day the world is going to change altogether. Because there's no coming back from that. This is this is going out to to meet species that you know exist that, that uh, are on other planets. You know the world here knows. That there are intelligent species out there. There's no question about it. It's just, we've never had contact with them before, and you guys are going to, to make that contact. Uh, so the world is going to be different tomorrow. So this is kind of the last night of it existing this way. So there is a certain kind of kind of trepidation, a certain uh, anxiety in the air about that. Um, and before long, people are, are that anxiety leads to uh, you know a, a small altercation. Um, two people are, are standing, uh, sitting on bar stools next to each other, um, the, and these are supposed to be bolted down, but, but uh, you know, there, there's uh, enough of a spin to one of them that uh, one guy gets angry at the other. You guys don't really exactly hear what, what occurs or what, what starts it, uh, but one of them gets angry at the other. You hear some shouting start, uh, and one of them grabs the other and slams his head into the, into the side of the bar there, um, and, it, and they're starting to swing at each other. It looks like the, the beginnings of a bar fight. What are you guys doing? Go over there and see if I can break it up. Uh, all right, so you, as you're getting up to, to head over that direction, uh, you see uh, Drew has stood up and, and is kind of heading over there as well. Uh, Elsbeth has, you guys, the, you know, the, the six of you were kind of seated at a at a like a booth, basically a three to a side. Um, Elsbeth and Drew uh, hop up; they were next. You know, you you were on the edge of it, uh, Peter. You're uh, sitting next to Elsbeth on one side of it. Um, but they've kind of hopped up. Drew's heading over towards them. Elspeth is, is moving over t towards the corner uh, where there are less people over there. Uh, and she's already starting to pull a, one of her journals out, uh, out from her pot. Like, she's got them on these side pouches. Uh, Peter, what are you doing? Uh, I'm just going to kind of stay back and see what's going on because uh, a fight without my name on it is, is, is not my fight. <laughs> all right. Uh, so Jack and Yorth aren't leaving the table either, so I guess the three of you then are, are all kind of sitting there together. Just uh, you, you notice that Yorth is looking over there with a big grin on her face. Um, it just, just seems like just gleefully watching this happen. Um, keep in mind, these aren't, these aren't trying to kill, these people aren't trying to kill each other. It's just, you know, a, you know uh, noisy and, and uh, probably just trying to burn off some anxiety here. 
Um, uh, Kiedis, you, you get there just in time as one of them is about to swing at the other. You, you have just enough time to step in. Uh, go ahead and roll a deck save. Dex check, sorry, not deck save. Okay. <laughs> Son of a bitch! <laughs> you, you you throw your arm in there, trying to catch uh, the the arm of the of the one guy trying to swing at the other, um, and you're you just didn't time it quite right. Yours passes straight through between. Um, you actually almost end up hitting the same guy, hitting the guy that, that just got punched in the jaw, uh, because you because you swing just you know at the wrong time, uh, and you end up stumbling kind of between the two of them. You're now between them, but not the way you exactly intended to. Um, Drew shows up right next to you, actually. Oops, grab the wrong thing. Uh, and he he does manage to kind of step between, and he pushes. Uh, you were a little bit closer to the guy that, that just got punched uh, in the jaw, uh, and and uh, he kind of steps over to the other and just kind of slowly kind of pushing him back a little bit. Drew is is a shorter guy. Uh, he's still he's a human, but he, he's short. He's about a head shorter than you. Um, but he's he's uh, he's got got some imposition to him. He, like he carries himself in a very confident way. Uh, and he's kind of pushing the, the, the other guy, the aggressor, back. Um, Kiedis, because you're facing that direction, actually, because you're facing the guy that just got punched, uh, you're kind of kind of helping him up a little bit, keeping him from, from falling too much. Um, you Noticing that, that looking over the corner, you see that, that Elspeth is is hastily jotting down notes in, in a journal. Like, she's just looking up and then writing, and looking up, writing, like, nonstop. Um, and uh, and the, the guy behind you shouts, uh, uh, he did not, and he swings again. Uh, make another dex check. I'd, I'd give you the option, actually. What do you, are you gonna? He's gonna swing towards the other guy, and he's close enough to be able to connect. What are you trying to do? Um, meh. See, I'll, I'll see if I can actually stop so the other guy doesn't get hit too. So see if I can catch his hand. You know, okay. Block so you're trying to, you're trying to catch the aggressors. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah try to stop it from either one of us from getting hit. Okay. Dex. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you actually, you throw your hand up uh, and kind of grab just under, like, his wrist, basically, and, and throw his, his wrist up. Um, in so doing, uh, it just it just kind of grazes your, your chin, not, not enough to hurt or anything like that, but just uh, you kind of feel that the fist kind of kind of scrape your chin a little bit. Um, just, a, just a scruff at the end of the night. Um, but it doesn't do any serious damage. You kind of pull his hand away. Uh, you're kind of getting him to, to calm down a little bit. It seems like they're still... Uh, still anxious, but um, you kind of settle them, to, uh, at least are, are stopping them from fighting. Um, you guys, well, Peter, what are you doing at the table? Uh, I'm actually was getting a little bit annoyed at what's going on over there, uh, so I was actually preparing a uh, prestidigitation spell just in case Kitas was unable to resolve this. Okay. But uh, yeah. Uh, Drew between them is is just you know telling them to 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 calm it down. Um, What? Sorry. Um, it was Fox for the, the preparation for Embers, the other campaign. She had a question about it. Uh, anyway, um, Drew is is trying his best to settle it as well. Um, he's kind of telling them to to calm it down. We're going to need everybody, you know, at full full shape for the following morning. Um, Kitas, you saying anything, or are you just uh, kind of telling them to, to shut it? Yeah, just the same thing. Just same. That's actually what I was going to say is what Drew said. We got a busy day tomorrow, so let's not beat each other up and waste all of our energy. Roll a persuasion. Well, I'll tell you what. You can choose. Do you want to do persuasion or intimidation? I guess for accomplishing the same result. Let me see. Whichever one you prefer. Oh, I will say too, by the way, that those the the titles you guys have. Keep in mind that that's just the. Uh, say what's on your name tag essentially right but you all of you are um, you bring a lot of different skills to the table so even though Navarra is the biologist well it doesn't mean that she's also not you know like some part of security for example or things like that obviously key to security as well that kind of stuff so there's no uh, th those are just kind of the official parts but same think of them like astronauts like an astronaut maybe have a specific um, uh, field but they're all engineers you know they're all capable of fixing things stuff like that um we're all potential red shirts. Uh, well, yeah, depending on how much you fuck up, yeah. <laughs> you, you, get, you get some bad rolls, you might be a red shirt. Um, anyway, so, so so you kind of kind of shout them down and, and uh, you know make them make them relax. Uh, you're kind of rubbing your jaw a little bit where that fist kind of scraped your your chin. 
Uh, nothing serious, but enough that you might have a little bit of a bruise the following morning. Um, again, nothing that actually hurt or anything of that sort, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the evening mostly calms down. Uh, everybody has their drinks, stuff like that. Are you guys doing anything in particular after that? Are you just heading off to bed and then getting ready for the mission in the morning? I can't think of anything else. Peter? I'll just kind of mosey around and see if I can find anybody that might be part of the crew and just kind of build some social then go home sure so you there's there i mean there's plenty there won't be uh there will there won't be people there won't be other people on the ship with you it's just going to be you seven on the ship it's kind of a small ship um but there are you know crew as far as assisting in the the takeoff and and you know the kind of ground crew there the, this whole place is kind of filled with them um but you you find um uh, a young lady who is going to be taking care of the timings. Uh, you don't know exactly what that refers to. Uh, you do know that uh, the drive itself, what is actually uh, powering the drive, it's called the Alcubierre drive. Uh, hang on. Uh, that's what it's called. But it is being powered by Apotheosis, which uh, the, the, um, we'll get to what that is in a bit. Uh, but basically, uh, the... the um, uh, crew member that you find, she she helps with the timing of that. Apotheosis has to spin in a certain way to power the Alcubierre drive, and it, basically it's a very delicate uh, maneuver. Um, and you guys kind of discuss that and how this part of it works. It's not something you specifically had to be working on too much, but but Yoris does mention this because she's stand, she's sitting nearby. Uh, she and Jack are talking, um, and she she helped design this drive. Um, Yorith is Nivara's sister, by the way. Uh, but the apotheosis is what is... It sits in the center of this ring, basically, and causes this whole thing to spin in a certain way. And if it were to get out of sync, then it could be disastrous. So it's uh, something important. And you guys kind of kind of go over this stuff, and she kind of sets your mind at ease, but at the same time, there's this kind of extra... Because you didn't know about it, and now you do, you just realize there's one more thing that could break in all of this, so that there's kind of this extra layer of nervousness that although she set some worries to rest, it kind of created these others in you. Uh, to be concerned about. But uh, evening comes, you guys kind of settle in for the night. Uh, you, you all get a full night's rest, uh, nice and nice and uh, uh, restful sleep and everything. You guys have kind of gotten used to, um, even though you have a, you know, a dangerous mission coming up, or, or in previous cases these have been um, test runs essentially, uh, but even though you have that coming up, you, you are getting you know, a nice rest that you kind of realize the importance of that and are able to kind of professionally set your minds down enough to, to just get some decent sleep. Um, and the following morning comes, and there is an excited but kind of trepidatious feeling in the air. Uh, sometime in the night, an ominous storm has rolled in that's blanketing the sky in these awful-looking thick gray motionless clouds, um, the kind that normally accompany a heavy rainfall, but there's just no rain coming yet. Uh, the IPRE has decided to proceed with the mission, though, so uh, you guys head out to the Hermian Shoes. Uh, it's a gleaming silver ship. There's this wide open deck. Uh, there's airlocks in three places that enter this kind of small but well-designed bridge uh, with windows all the way around. Um, th th there's this kind of uh, sleeping and dining quarters, all that stuff are all below deck, but uh, there's enough space for seven people to live comfortably. Uh, but most of the size of this ship is to power the drive. I'm going to show you an image here, um, which is this massive spinning ring at the back. Well, spins when it's flying anyways. Um, this propulsion system that's called the Alcubierre Drive that allows faster than light travel. And Apotheosis sits at the center of this giant ring. Um, and it is what you, you, you've seen this a few times and, and now that uh, you know, they're kind of preparing for this that uh, you, you are going to uh, you know, take a closer look at it. Apotheosis looks like what's called a, a dodecahedron. It looks like a 20-sided shape. Um, and it's spinning in the center of this. There's this gleaming ball of like an orb of light with, with some jagged edges to it, like a, like a gem almost. Um, and it's just spinning and rotating in the center of this. Uh, a little bit slower now, but apparently as it begins to take off, you'll, that will spin faster and faster, which will cause the ring to spin around it, uh, which is where your propulsion comes from. So the seven of you climb aboard the shoes, uh, as you come to call it, uh, and you kind of wave and smile for the crowd below, which looks equal part excited for your departure, but also nervous because there's a storm hanging overhead. And if you hadn't been so focused and nervous about this mission, you might have noticed the unnatural stillness of this dark blanket that's in the sky, or the way that the color seemed to kind of be slowly draining out from the world around you. But you didn't notice it, and you carried on with the mission, uh, and you guys are standing on the bridge, um, which is inside, basically. The, the deck is outside, the bridge is inside, with, with, with windows being able to see. Uh, and you watched as Captain Drew took the shoes up and through the storm and into the stars and past the stars, and as the ship's Alcubierre drive, that big ring, 
uh, kicks on and spins around uh, Apotheosis. You, uh, it's it's kind of pulling you. You feel it beginning to, to pull the the ship out of the prime material plane, and that's when you see it, and that's when the panic kicks in. You see the hunger. Uh, you don't call it that yet. That's really annoying with audios. Uh, you don't call it that yet, but you see it reaching down and into your world, and you see its dark tendrils sort of reaching down around your ship uh, and into the world that you're flying away from. Uh, Captain Drew barks out orders to Elspeth, who tries to tries and fails to contact the Institute, and then Drew makes the call. You're escaping, and you're going to regroup, and you're going to return when the time is right, when things are safer, and you and your team can make evasive maneuvers. Uh, you, get, you and your team make evasive maneuvers to dodge those dead black tendrils, and you fly far enough away uh, to, to watch as the planet and this, this entity that's attacking begins to shrink behind you. Uh, and out here, away from this planet, space is, is acting very strangely. You've kind of passed through this 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 jiggly film. Um, and as you your home is consumed behind you, surrounded by this this uh, dead black shape, uh, you pass through the threshold that you can't see or comprehend, and then time comes to a stop. And you can feel yourselves being torn apart. You feel these projections of yourself all frozen in place, uh, all on the bridge of the shoes, all sort of firing outward from you in all directions, just thousands of Navaras and Peters and Ketuses and Yoris and Jacks all around you, just bursting away from yourselves but frozen in place. Uh, and then with a flash, they're all pulled back in, and those images kind of snap back into into each of you, and you're unstuck. You're 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 moving again, uh, and this gleaming ball of light sails overhead, and at an impossible speed, it flings far off into the distance, looking like it's crashed into the planet below. Uh, Captain Drew makes the makes the call. You're flying back toward the planet, albeit at a much slower speed. Uh, the ship seems to be crippled somehow. You're not really quite sure why just yet. Uh, a quick check has shown, though, that somehow Apotheosis, that gleaming dodecahedron, somehow has jostled itself loose from that drive and is shot off like a bullet into the distance. That was a glowing orb that you saw. Uh, so you're heading back to the planet, but that storm is gone now. Uh, and after a few minutes of observing the surface, it doesn't take long for the seven of you to realize that this is not the world that you left. This is not the reality you left. This is a different reality altogether. Uh, the first of many that you guys are going to encounter during this mission. And now we're on year one. So what I was describing earlier that we're going to be doing here is this this arc called The Stolen Century. Uh, we won't be playing a hundred of them, despite it being called The Stolen Century. We're going to be skipping many, of course. Uh, we're only going to be playing through a handful. But um, basically, this time, we're going to play through the block of time that had been removed by the baby Dallin's cap from you. Um, so obviously the, the important story beats, there might be a couple of, of uh, uh, you know, years that we play in there um, that you guys will, you know, that I don't have any major story points for you, but I just want to, you know, give you guys some, some freedom to, to kind of develop your characters in if you choose. Uh, but anyways, they won't be, you know, each one won't be a session or anything like that. We might get through two or three in a session. Uh, but we'll be going to different planets, basically, that, are, that have these different things. And your goal uh, each time is that you want to recover the apotheosis as many times as you can. Um, and the way I described that, did you get, did that make sense that, that uh, the apotheosis kind of broke out of the ship and flew off in the distance? Did you guys catch that? Yeah, it looked like it went down to the planet, you said, right? Exactly. Yeah. Looks like it did. Yeah. So you're, each time that you guys go through this you're going to be you're going to recover it and fly off and it's going to it's going to stay in there but trying to break out the entire time and the closer you get to the hunger it's going to break again and fly off again and you're going to have to try to recover it and the more often you recover it the easier the ending will be for you is how i'll describe that so if you, if that's going to be your challenge each time essentially is that you uh you know if we go through six or eight or ten or however many of these uh, uh cycles you're, that you're actually going to play through you want to try to recover it as often as you can um because the ending will be easier. I'll explain. That, that'll make sense later on. Um, so that's kind of what your goal is each time, is to get it back. Um, but you, you notice uh, immediately upon your descent into this planet's atmosphere that the continents and oceans are just different from the shapes that, that you guys are used to. Uh, so immediately you're just, you're just like, this is, this is not right. This world is far more verdant than the one you just left. Uh, there's thick forests just pretty, pretty much everywhere. Uh, Captain Drew doesn't really know where to, to bring the ship, so he kind of aims for the spot that you guys all agree has to be somewhere in the vicinity that the Apotheosis crashed down at. Uh, and he brings the shoe sort of close to this large forested area just north of this planet's equator. Um, and it's dark on this side of the planet. It, 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 it's still, you know, th this does have a star and everything. Normally there is a light phase of the day, but it, right now it's dark over here. Uh, and you don't see any obvious signs of civilization or of the impact where the, where the Apotheosis may have hit. Uh, at first you see no signs of intelligent life at all, but uh, after flying low over this area for a few hours, you come to, to notice that there is an occasional shuffle of grayish fur down on the surface. Uh, so you kind of go, he brings the ship down a little bit lower. 
and you begin to see creatures that are largely humanoid in shape but run uh, and walk quadrupedally down on all fours, uh, resembling something uh, between a gorilla and a wolf uh, that dot the landscape. Uh, you rarely see more than two or three grouped together. Uh, most of them seem to stand up on their hind legs, though, and look up at your ship as you fly over. Uh, and there's there's a, there's a very clear, uh, this is something Navarra points out, a clear look of keen intellect in their in their eyes. They definitely look predatory. Um, you don't necessarily know if they're hostile, uh, but they're, there's a keen kind of staring and following. The eyes are following the ship as you guys fly over. So here you are. Uh, the Hermian Shoes has lost its primary propulsion method. Uh, the Apotheosis, which has dislodged itself from the Alcubierre Drive and crashed on the surface of this alien planet that appears to be inhabited by these uh, potentially hostile gorilla wolves. What do you guys do? I guess we need to get out and go look for it, right? Have we landed? Mr. Landed? You're still floating above. It's up to you guys what you want to do. What do you guys think? Get out here and look on foot, or do you want to fly around more and look? I think we're landing kind of close to where we think it might have landed, right? Uh, Jack has pointed out that, that from the telemetry you guys were able to pull, it looks like it had to have landed somewhere around here. Uh, you just don't see any kind of an impact. Now, it isn't huge. The, the size of the apotheosis is only, uh, think of the size of a basketball. So, I mean, it's not big. You wouldn't have been able to see the impact necessarily unless it had a pretty, uh, you know, unless it was on fire, let's, you know, something something like a comet, let's say. Um, so it's it would be difficult to find, especially in a forested area like this. Um, you just know that, that based from what Jack has told you, that it has to have landed somewhere near here. Yeah, I mean, if we're still in the ship, uh, if we have any tools that can kind of detect any type of high energy or something like that, maybe we can just use that and go on foot. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. All right, then I will say uh, some of these things, by the way, I'm going to have you guys making rolls with your with your guys' normal character stats and everything, but some of them we will be narratively explaining as utilizing um, the mechanics of this ship, let's say. So go ahead and make an arcana check uh, with Peter, and we'll, we'll narratively we'll describe it as in a way that you're kind of using the ship to uh, accelerate your own kind of control, your own uh, means of, of searching for this. So... Um, so I would say because the the apotheosis itself is the strongest uh, source of any arcane energy that you've ever been able to detect. Like in fact, when it when it first became um, known and, and found uh, that at the IPRE, you could almost know you, you really were so washed out by the power source there that trying to detect anything else nearby was was a waste of time because it was just being washed over by by the source of the uh, apotheosis. Um, also, it's called the, the, it's called Light of Creation, by the way. Uh, but Apotheosis is the colloquial name. Um, anyways, you uh, because of how powerful it is, uh, you're able to kind of triangulate a little bit. You can't tell exactly where it is because it's just so blinding. It'd be like looking for, um, you know, if, if you took a floodlight and, and, you know, had it surrounded by mirrors pointing in all directions, finding the source of that would be difficult in the dark. Uh, but if you kind of went to far over here to the left and then kind of get an idea of what direction it's coming from and then move far over to the right and then get a direction where it's coming from, you can kind of triangulate uh, where it is. And you, you end up doing that uh, very carefully um, until you, um, with, it, it takes you a few hours, but you end up finding um, a, a sort, like you, you know that it has to be coming from this range of, of uh of mountains, um, so you take the ship kind of in that area. That's still, you know, a pretty significant uh, space to be looking over, um, and it takes you a, a couple of weeks at this point um, to be able to find this. But you, over the span of a couple of weeks, you kind of narrow down where this is coming from um, until you, you know, day night, the, the abnormal kind of kind of cycles here. Um, it begins to rain one of these days. Um, and then you come across that you're pretty sure that that spark is coming from just down there, and it looks like it's it's. Um, in a cave that you can't exactly access from the ship, the ship can't land there. Um, but there's a cave up in the mountains that that you're pretty sure it's inside there. At least it is right now. You're going to need to land the shoes somewhere at the, the in the foothills, essentially, of these mountains to be able to get up to it and then hike your way up to it. Cool. Sounds good. Find a clearing. Okay. Uh, Drew agrees then uh, and and flies the ship off to to this clearing. Um, as you guys are preparing for it, he says, well, I'm, I'm going to leave this, uh, the control of this away mission to Naivara here because it doesn't seem to be much uh, in the way of hostility here or, or dangerous circumstances. Like, the air is breathable, everything seems to be fine here, but if these 
uh, gorilla wolf-like creatures down here end up being hostile. It's kind of going to be on you, Nivara. So, so I'm going to leave uh, the away mission up to to you. So, you know, who do you want to take with you? What's the what's the plan? He's going to stay with the ship. Um, well, I definitely need to take Peter and Cadis with me. Oh well, uh, come on! I wanted to leave them behind. I just wanted it to be all NPCs <laughs> and Becky <laughs> for the whole thing. <laughs> awesome. Uh, how about so Yorith? Uh, do you want to do you want to bring Yorith or Jack or um, or well, Drew's gonna stay. So Yorith or Jack or Elsbeth, or I mean, you can leave all three of them. It can just be the three of you. It's up to you guys. Keep in mind too. I'll say it this way: there will be uh, without giving too much away. Um, you don't want to bring everybody all the time, and there may be you know different uh, ver- or different of uh, these sessions where you're kind of on a planet for a little while. Uh, maybe you know you don't always want to bring everybody, and you don't always li- want to leave everybody behind. There, there, there might be situations where you know, and just think about. It, I'll, I'll give you clues when it's necessary. But if there, you know, if you bring somebody that uh, you know maybe needed on the ship or something like that, there could be results. There could be uh, downsides to to either of those things going the wrong way. So which you know, by all means, pick whoever you'd like to. I would say this one you probably know major penalties either way, but. Uh, you know, keep that in mind. Okay, well, what do you guys think? Take Jack? Yeah, that's fine. Leave everybody else. Yeah. So I have three people behind. Okay, yeah. so Elsbeth, yeah. uh, Elsbeth, Yorith, and, and Drew staying with the ship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jack says, yeah, that I think that probably tracks just in case, you know, if somebody gets hurt. You know, I know you guys are are capable as well, but just in case, you know, better to, to keep everybody safe. And and I, I bet Drew, Yorith, and and uh, and Elspeth here, if those ones are staying on the ship, I don't imagine that these wolf-like creatures would be too dangerous. Um, Drew does say, all right, well, you know, you guys making your way all the way up there and then trying to hike back down, that this could be risky. So uh, you do have short-range communication, by the way. You're able to talk to each other over short distances. You know, if you're on the other side of the planet, it's not going to work. But you guys essentially have rocky talkies similar to what you, you know, had in the future. Uh, and you're, you know, in the, the kind of, I, I say, let's say the present, because you guys are playing in the past right now. Um, but, you know, they won't work all the way across the planet, but for short range like this, it'd still be okay. So you'll still be able to communicate. Uh, but, you know, he, he tells you to, if something serious happens, if something, you know, goes on that, uh, you know, could be risky or something like that, let them know and they'll, you know, see what they can do from, from, from range or, or, you know, try to you know, emergency evacue, that kind of stuff. Okay. So you guys ready to go then? So you, you step out of the ship. Um, it is a little bit cooler here as far as, you know, the the, uh, the temperature. It's a little colder uh, on the surface here than you're used to. Uh, not yeah, not so much that it's um, uncomfortable, at least down here at the foothills, although it does seem likely that it will once you get a little bit further up into the mountains. Um, but you guys step out into this clearing here um, in these kind of thick woods uh, in the foothills. Uh, and we can kind of kind of hiking your way up the the way. Um, I will say distance wise, just from from where you saw the the cave in the mountains being, um, you it's you're expecting it going to take you most of the day to get there. So it's not going to be um, you know something you're going to get there short term. It's going to take you a little bit of a of a hike um, throughout the day. Are you guys trying to do anything in particular? I guess you guys tell me what you're doing. I guess on your trip there. I'm going to be always trying to keep an eye out for anything coming up close to us. Any of those gorilla wolf things. Okay. Um, what are, we'll, we'll get back to that in just a second then. What are uh, Navarra and Peter doing? Um, I would probably just be studying the wildlife and stuff as we're walking by trying to learn what I can from it. Okay. I mean, this is alien. So. I'll be going, uh, I'll be obsessively going over like divination thoughts and kind of looking around and looking for for ways to improve myself at that time okay um then in that case i will say roll we'll start with Nivaras. then roll a um nature check You, in looking around, and, and some of this will even be, you know, you, you and, and Kitas kind of quietly speaking to each other. You guys all three, uh, and Jack included, are um, being very cautious in, in uh, you know, speaking out loud just in case. Uh, this is, you know, after all, the first alien uh, 
play, you don't necessarily know exactly the situation. It doesn't exactly feel like um, like you've gone somewhere else. It almost feels like you've come back to the same planet, but it's definitely not the same planet. Um, you uh, don't worry about that for right now. Um, but basically, the first kind of time you, that, as far as you know, anybody from your home planet, anyways, have ever stepped foot on on a on a uh, alien surface. Um, the surroundings, as far as the plant life and animal life, look. Uh, similar, but but different enough, of course, to, to stand out. So you you know are, are as you're kind of making this trek through, um, you know, kind of mentally trying to record all your you know notes of, of the the style of, of uh, uh, you know the, the species that surround you. There are small insects that look like dragonflies um, that, that keep flitting about. Um, that uh, the tail of instead of just being kind of a long proboscis, uh, the, the tail end of this has a uh, it curls up and around itself, almost like a scorpion's tail. Um, things, things of that nature, like things that, that look close but not quite right. Um, you know, like a, a different branch of an evolutionary tree that, that didn't occur um, on your home planet. Uh, but, you, but between kind of discussing amongst yourselves and doing so, you know, on a, a very quiet level, uh, as you guys are, 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 you know, kind of heading up this way, um, you're taking close uh, attention, uh, paying close attention rather to the. Um, life that is here how it might interact like if this you know or is this kind of an animal does it look like it would be um, feeding on the insects and then this you know a, a, a thing that looks like a big bull weevil is that you know more predatory in nature is it feeding on the you know the smaller rodents things like that um, but they're you're surrounded by life I mean it, it looks like the same kind of a if the species were, were cut and pasted into the you know your the world that you're used to it wouldn't be all that out of out of the norm um the the rocks themselves do feel a little bit uh, squishy almost which is which is a little bit different um you know un underfoot it almost feels like just a, a very very slight difference like you're watching uh, walking on like almost of a spongy surface um but not heavily enough that it's you know you're not sinking into it or anything of that sort they just don't feel quite as solid uh as where you're you're from uh gravity itself feels a little bit light here like maybe it's only 0.9 of the gravity that you're used to um but in, in looking through all of these things, and, and Kedis, you're making similar kind of mental notes of, of the, uh, the flora uh, around here, that the trees um, that are surrounding where this kind of a region in the world that you're from would usually be covered in evergreen trees. It would be pines and things like that. Um, these here uh, have these thick um, fruit almost, like they look like they're a fruit almost, but almost uh, like a, like a basketball-sized um, growths that are hanging off of the branches. Uh, that are forcing all the branches low um, so they're kind of hanging you know deep around it and you, you don't see anything eating these things you just see that they, so it doesn't look like they're intended to be food uh, or at least not a food source that these creatures nearby are eating but the plant life definitely has a uh, kind of a bulbous nature to it um, but you kind of carefully make your way up the the the, the uh, cliffside there um, Peter I guess give me more of an idea what it is you're looking at specifically as far as divination well, pretty much it's just a new area, new everything, so it's always an opportunity just to kind of keep my eyes open for any type of uh, runes or relics or anything that might have been left behind um, that can aid me in my, my education. Okay. Uh, make a flat intelligence check on Peter. Um, where you are, you aren't seeing anything that that would resemble civilization of any kind uh recent or or not um you are th this this area um and you have of course some familiarity with the kind of uh, ecosystem structures that you would see at home um and this feels like kind of native foresty mountains uh there doesn't appear to be um, you know, any disturbance. This doesn't look like there was statues here or anything that would have been created by an intelligent species around here. Um, make a history check as well. Um, you do know that back home, um, some of the shorter species, some of the, 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 the say, we'll say a species kin, akin to dwarves on the planet that you're from, um, not actually dwarves, but, uh, you know, something smaller like that, 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 uh, are known for creating vast tunnels underground and living in those, um, that 
when it came to those, when the species were first kind of kind of uh, intermingling, this is long before Peter was born. This is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, probably probably fifteen hundred or so years um, before Peter was born, when that species kind of surfaced when they came up. Um, they had been under the ground for forever, they, as long as they remember, as long as their history went back, um, and there were no obvious dwellings or, or any obvious um, signs of their existence on the surface. Um, so you kind of are thinking of that as you're as you're traveling up these these uh, this kind of mountainous foothills as you're kind of heading up into the uh, into the to the rocky terrain. That despite there not being any visible evidence on the surface, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't something below the surface. So just something that you're kind of thinking about as you're as you're kind of heading your way up, um, and, and you and Jack actually are discussing this a little bit back and forth. That um, despite you guys not seeing anything as you were flying over in the ship, uh, not seeing any uh, cities or or statues of anything that, that would be obvious, that it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't something there. So you guys continue on your way up the hill there. Uh, doing anything specific? Are you just heading up to that cave? Just head up to the cave. Yeah. All right. Uh, give me one second here. Let me grab that. Um, in fact, actually, let me while I'm grabbing that, let me try to switch this because the projector's starting to flicker a whole bunch, and I don't want it to get too bad. So let's do uh, let's take a quick five minutes um, while I while I get that set up. Um, probably won't take a full five, but just give me you know give me a couple minutes to get that set up. If you guys want to take a quick break, sounds good. All right, guys. We'll have uh, well because Sako's got to go at four, right? Yeah, four-ish. If it goes a little over, it's fine. Okay. All right. And we'll have yeah, we'll probably go another half hour, forty minutes or so, um, and then we'll we'll pick up here uh, next next week. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, just give me a couple minutes if you would. Thanks. Okay.
Just a sec here. <laughs> Director's gonna drive me nuts. I'm so mad about it. Okay. share this to you. Yeah, very carefully, uh, this might take a minute for you guys to download, uh, you guys have very carefully kind of made your way up the the uh, outer um, trail that, that leads up to this. There isn't much of a trail so much as just a, uh, you know, kind of you have to head over this direction to climb up this part because it's a little less steep than the part next to it and so on. Uh, so you kind of have to switch back over and over again until you make it up to the entrance here. Um, and you can see that the entrance to this cavern here. Um, uh, Peter, you're, you're quite certain that the, uh, that the apotheosis is inside here. You, you can just feel it just from the, the uh, uh, source is being so strong. Um, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, have I rolled my bones yet? Uh, no, go ahead and do that, actually. Uh, that's a 3d20. Yep. Like a one may sound like it's bad, but that's super useful because you can give it to bad guys. And then uh, uh, 19 and a 15 both useful enough to get yourself uh, high enough scores. All right. Uh, so uh, th that narratively, of course, you did that on the ship in the morning. Um, it, keep in mind, it's been we're about a month into uh, since you you've gotten here uh, to the surface or to this to this other planet. Um, after, you know, as you've done enough research trying to track down where this apotheosis is. Um, it, during that time, by the way, I would say that uh, um, between Drew, Elsbeth, and Jack, uh, who are the most kind of science-minded, um, Yorth is, is strongly too, but she's more of an engineer. Uh, but the three of them have kind of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, have on some level kind of identified that, that one, obviously this isn't where you guys are from, and for you to be able to get out of here at all, you're going to need the apotheosis back. So that's kind of why you guys are, are out here doing this. Um, you're going to need to recover that to be able to even get out of here to, to you know, have a chance of getting home. Um, so you guys have kind of carefully made your way up to this, this cavern. Um, you, just from staying out of here, uh, I would say all three of you make uh, perception rolls. Damn. Um, Peter and Ivara both. Uh, Kitas, you're, you're kind of smelling around trying to see what is in here. Um, and you, you're not exactly distracted by, but you keep kind of paying more attention to the moss that's growing on the inside of these walls here. Um, there's kind of a glistening um, property to it that, that the, the moss, as you're looking at it, uh, seems to be glowing, uh, even though there's no light source. Like, it's, 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 um, think of it like glitter that's glittering in the dark. There's nothing for it to be glittering from. It doesn't appear to have any bioluminescence or anything to it, um, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's reflecting light that isn't there. Um, it, it is kind of, it's covering the inside of walls of this, of this cavern here. Um, and as you're kind of not distracted so much as just paying more attention to that, you're not exactly noticing that 
Uh, inside, a little bit further into the cavern, you're hearing breathing, so there's definitely things alive in here. Um, and it smells very strongly of, of animals. So Peter and, and Navar, you definitely recognize that there are live creatures inside of this cavern. What are you guys doing? Can we see? I'm going to throw out my orbs of light just to kind of give us some, some light down the, down the okay. cave. Yeah, because it, it's actually it's very dark. Uh, it, it's dark outside on this side of the planet right now. Uh, by the time, because remember, you guys traveled all day to get here, and it's it's evening time again, and the sun's already pretty much gone down behind uh, by the you know behind these mountain range. Um, so it would be very dark. Uh, Peter, you throwing your orbs out, you can see um, pretty far into the cavern here. You'll be able to see. Oops, I didn't mean to hold shift to that. Hang on. Um, you can see that the cavern entrance splits two ways. Um, and you, there's, you can, uh, here, I'll reveal that part there too. Um, it looks like it goes off to the north a little bit and then off to the east a little bit. The one off to the east looks like it opens up into a big chamber and there's, there's breathing coming from in there. Well, go see what it is or what do you guys think? Yeah. Laptop. Yeah, I guess it's post right in the center, kind of look both ways, see what's going on. Yeah. Um, let me grab that image. Hang on one second. I wish that would change this so that I could just drop it in. It'd be a lot easier. That won't. That doesn't mean anything to you guys. Don't worry about that. But when I need to grab these things, some of them I have to do manually, and it takes a second. That'd be cool when they add it, though. There we go. All right. Um, I guess do me a favor on the. Okay, you guys did move yourselves in. Uh, Peter, move yourself to where where you're. Um, that um, Jack is cautiously coming up behind, um, and he you see that he's got. Um, in, in one hand, he's holding his journal, basically, like he's taking notes. Uh, you get the impression, by the way, he's not taking these notes for himself. Um, like like maybe uh, Elspeth has tasked him with with because uh, she habitually throughout this entire time by the way has always been been taking notes and, and writing these things down writing everything down that they see um, and and uh, maybe she's kind of talked him into doing that for her since she's on the ship anyway uh, so he's kind of looking all around he's making notes uh, about the the moss he's making notes about the kinds of smell that the uh, that are in here the kinds of sounds that he's hearing etc uh, Peter when you've stepped up to that point. Um, your where are you moving your orbs with you, or what are you doing with them? Uh, the orbs, we're going to keep. Uh, it's four orbs, right? Yeah. Yeah, two are going to kind of hover above us just for room lighting. Okay. Uh, one orb, I'm going to send down the top hallway, and one to the east, just to kind of illuminate ahead of us. Okay. Uh, you before you've even gotten that far, you you would have started hearing growling by the time you got to like here. You're hearing like a deep throated, uh, very guttural sounding growling. So I mean, you you can keep walking up there. I just like I just wanted to you know let you know about there. You would have started hearing a growling coming from the east, from the big chamber over there. And you can I mean, if you've gotten that far, you'd be able to see. Yeah, I was thinking of just slicing the pie and kind of looking down the hall. All right, I just revealed part of the map that Stealthily. you can see into. Um, you can see that. Um, but as soon as that's revealed, uh, the growling sounds, you see the source of it. And uh, let me go ahead and I'll share it to you guys here. If I can find him. Can I really not? Well, that's going to be annoying. Hang on one sec, guys. I thought I could drop him in the middle of the, the game, but maybe not. Oh, because I named him wrong. There it is. All right. I named him Map, but he's not a map, if that was not uh, clear for you guys. You see this creature uh, in the, the, the cavern over there on the right. 
that has growled and is, is uh, like I said, a very guttural kind of a growling sound. Um, and as soon as he sees you, is making threatening gestures, is basically standing there the way that a gorilla might, uh, where he's kind of kind of banging his fists into the ground in front of you. Looks like he's about to charge towards Peter. What are you guys doing? Is there a small child that can drop in the cave? <laughs> uh, I'll go ahead and drop a token on there so you guys can see where he is. Can I use speak with animals? You can certainly try. Sec. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry. If her speak with animals doesn't work, I have an idea next. Go uh, banana at it. <laughs> well, it's part dog too. I might not like it. No, see, now we need to jar bees. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, in this we, narrative, we, gotta, we, we does not have a jar of bees right now, so that is not going to help you. <laughs> that is not cool. Yeah, for for once, his jar of bees will not help this solution. Uh, there we go. Damn it, did I rotate him wrong? There we go. Let me make him visible. Uh, he is massive and is, is, looks like he only barely fits into this place. Uh, ignore that the token is a werewolf, but it was just, uh, the only one that I had that was, uh, close. Uh, anyway, um, looking aggressive and hostile, um, and is kind of, kind of banging his fist against the ground and then kind of slamming them together and then banging them against the ground, causing dust and, and, uh, kind of bits of bone and, and, uh, uh, dirt from the ground kind of puff up around him, uh, making himself look bigger kind of thing. Um, what level is that speak with animals, uh, Becky? Uh, it should be one, I believe. Yeah, level one. All right. Speak with animals. That's a ritual. Well, you're not doing it as a ritual, though. Uh, casting him as one action. You gain the ability to comprehend and verbally communicate with beasts for the duration. The knowledge and awareness of many beasts is limited by their intelligence, but at minimum, beasts can give you information with, about nearby location and monsters, including whatever they perceive or have perceived uh, within the past day. You might be able to persuade a beast to perform a small favor for you at the DM's discretion. Uh, so go ahead and mark off your spell slot for it. You, um, oh, actually, was there, we can't, uh, damn it, I just lost it, hang on. Verbal and somatic, okay. Uh, so you, you mumble the, uh, necessary incantation, um, and, and kind of flash your, your fingers towards it. What was the range on that? It says self. I guess it's just if they're close enough to be able to hear you? And you hear them? I, it's got to be it, because you're casting it on yourself, not on them. So uh, I guess that makes sense anyways, as long as it can hear you, which it can, and you can hear it. So that's fine. Um, but you, you kind of go through this this, uh, this uh, little you know, short uh, uh, casting and, and prepare it for yourself. Your eyes begin to go, it's kind of greenish uh, hue to them. Um, and it continues banging its fist against the ground and doesn't appear to notice that you've done anything. What are you, what are you doing? What are you trying to say or do? Um, I guess just try to let it know that we don't want it, you know, don't mean it any harm. We're just, we're here to get something that we lost. Hmm. Roll, so you're not trying to intimidate it, you're trying to persuade it, you'd say? Yeah. Okay, roll a persuasion. Um, it, it... Uh, it doesn't speak anything, but it's grumbles. Um, it continues kind of growling at you guys, um, and it's still banging its fist against the ground. And it's moved uh, to it kind of kind of shuffled itself a little bit closer, um, still looking hostile. Um, but the body language and the way that it's kind of did I reveal that part? The the, the way that it's um, communicating to you uh, in its animalistic way is uh, saying that it will not um, allow you here to be here for very long. You basically have to hurry or it's basically it doesn't have much patience is the is, is what you've understood it to be telling you. Okay, then maybe we should hurry up, guys. Okay. Uh, so, Peter, actually, since you came up here, were you looking down the hallway, or were you keeping your eyes on the, on the, the creature? I was kind of slicing the pie just to look up there, just to see if there's anything coming from that area. Okay. Uh, 
Um, with the orb floating above your head, you're able to see about this much that it looks like it opens up into another chamber here. Uh, there is more noise coming from up there, by the way. That, that, that creature was not the only one in here. Now that you've kind of, as soon as you step to where you are right now, you heard this same kind of uh, uh, breathing and, and kind of aggressive grumbling sound coming from the north as well. So you heard it coming from two different directions. This is the only one that you could see was the one there, but there there appears to be at least one more up above. All right, so I think we're cool with the guy down there for at least a minute or two, right? Yeah, we hurry. In and out, I guess let's run up and uh, see what's going on. Well, that one up there isn't going to know what we're doing either, so we might want to go slow. Yeah, maybe I can calm that one down too. This lasts for 10 minutes. We'll see. Yeah. The communication lasts for 10 minutes. The calm part, yeah. that doesn't necessarily. Does that make well, sense? Well, no, I just meant the communication. The spell's still going. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You could still communicate with. Yes, yes, yes. So you can try to talk to the other one too, maybe. <laughs> All right. God, I freaking laptop. I gotta change that so it doesn't fall asleep so often. Or try to sleep. All right. Um, you do see when you're coming around the corner, by the way, uh, now that you guys have kind of moved your way up a little bit, uh, Jack uh, is keeping very close to Peter right now. Um, and he's keeping a close eye on this on this wolf creature, and you notice that he's, um, Peter, you, you looking over, you notice that he's kind of trying to sketch how it looks, uh, like, and he's he's a, he's decent at this. Uh, his his uh, art is is better um, than you might expect, you know, a doctor to be good at. Usually, doctors are known for chicken scratch, but he's actually making a, a decent drawing of this creature um, as he's kind of trying to eye it without staring at it, because you you all three of you have gotten the impression, and Jack included that uh, staring at these in the eyes would be a bad idea. Um, uh, just, you know, based on the, the kind of uh, aggressive nature that they've got. Um, anyway, you're, you're hearing uh, coming from up north, uh, make a make a perception check on Peter, or on Kita, sorry. Um, as soon as you guys kind of stepped into that little kind of small section there, you heard moving of at least two creatures from around the corner, um, just basically just up ahead, uh, and there is a light source from in there. there. There's light coming from in that in that next cavern area, um, and you heard movement of at least two creatures in there that uh, probably moved out of your vision, you're guessing, because you can't see them now. But with Peter's dancing lights, you can see that far ahead. It looks like there's a small frozen over pool. What are you doing? Hmm. Do a little bit closer. Can I see anything for me? Yeah, you from there actually. Hang on, I'll reveal this. Just about. from knowing the size of the creature that we've just encountered, yeah, um, could I just gauge the probability of a successful sleep spell on something like that? So sleep, how that I, I, we went over that just briefly once before. Uh, depending on if you cast it, at, I think it's first level or second level. Uh, definitely not. If you cast it at a higher level, maybe. Because how it works basically for sleep is is you put a certain number of HPs of the creature to sleep. Um, th that's it's overly complicated. It's literally the most complicated spell, um, which is dumb for such a low level spell. But basically, you put if it has 100 HPs and you roll high enough, then you could put it to sleep. But you would need to cast it at a high enough level to be able to get to 100, if that makes sense. Uh, so it, I think it starts with like 4d6. So if it was a goblin, it'll put two of them to sleep. If it's uh, you know a, a bigger creature, then you would need to add that much more dice. To add that much more dice, you'd have to use a much higher level spell slot. Gotcha. Uh, but coming around that corner, Peter, you can see this so far. Navara, uh, sorry, Kitas can see this. Uh, Peter and Navara and Jack have not seen this so far. There is one more of these creatures that had scurried out of the way, uh, and as soon as you come around the corner, uh, Kitas and can see it. It scurries again until it's out of the way again. Uh, this one, slightly smaller, uh, well, quite a bit smaller, okay. but still, still much bigger than you. 
um, and very, uh, let's call it, it's probably, if it stood up on its hind legs, it'd probably be seven feet tall uh, and and just pure muscle, like a, like a seven foot tall gorilla, let's say. And still looks aggressive, still looks uh, threatening but has scurried out of the way to not be visible to you. The light source is coming from right behind there, by the way. Okay, from behind the pond. Yeah, to the right of the pond. Yeah, okay. I'll just kind of move behind the rock there. Okay. Um, Jack, in, in coming back up behind us, guys, we... We need to hurry and get out of here. This this thing is like, and he's staring at the the one that's back in the cave. There, he says he, he doesn't look like he's gonna gonna let us in here for very long. All right, Navarro, you want to see if you can? Leroy Jenkins. Going over there. <laughs> okay, uh, coming around the corner, you see two of those same type of creatures, similar in size, um, right there, uh, and you can actually see the rest of where this light source is coming from. But uh, oddly enough, you, as soon as you come around this corner, see smooth hewn stone that has been carved into stairs and pillars and what looks to be the front of some kind of, like a, uh, say, a fortification, like a, an in, in stone carved building, uh, similar to the uh, dwarf like uh, species at home. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and reveal this, even though you guys can't see that corner. But uh, anyways, um, and the two, the light source are two braziers that are next to it. This looks like the front of like a like a bank you might even see at home, uh, an under under uh, stone under mountain kind of a bank. Um, but these creatures don't exactly have the uh, wherewithal, as far as you can tell so far. And certainly after trying to communicate with the one outside, um, you don't sense the kind of intellect or. Um, let's say, ingenuity that it would take to be able to build something like this. But regardless, these two creatures are standing in front of it, um, and as you've come around the corner, now that they've seen a second, they, they, could, they can smell, of course, how many of you are in here, but uh, now that they've seen a second one that are keep kind of pushing them back, they are looking extremely aggressive and look like they're about to attack. What are you guys doing? Alright, well, I guess I'll just try to talk to them, tell them the same thing I told the first one. Okay. Um... I would say because of the kind of threatening gesture of invading a little bit further into their home like this, go ahead and roll persuasion again, but you're going to roll at a disadvantage this time. Partially because there's two, and if one of them makes an attack, they're both going to, and partially uh, because this is, you know, you're kind of inside their home, and they don't they don't know what you are. Castle Doctrine. Uh, okay. Uh, I just saw you move yourself, Kitas. Are you... She's, next to Navarro. she's speaking to them out loud verbally. You go up and step next to her while she's doing that? No, wait. Here's that one, not in front of her. Okay. The, um, between the two of them, they, they're they kind of like chuffing and banging their fists together. They keep standing, they're, they're standing on all four fists, or all four feet, really. Um, their front looking like resembling hands just with sharp claws. Uh, they kind of curl around themselves so the claws are, are moving up past their wrist, basically. Um, as opposed to digging into their to their palms, but they uh, kind of as they're standing there like that, they bang their fists into the ground, and then they'll stand up and kind of smash their fists together, um, and then and then kind of pound the ground again. Um, and they're they're kind of turning briefly. Who is it? Hang on, buddy. Um, they keep kind of turning and looking at each other, um, and and they don't appear to be backing down and they've stepped one uh, stepped forward a little bit uh, if they, they they're moving forward and don't look like it has worked is how I'll say that uh, Kedis and Peter anything you guys are doing because it looks like it's about to break out yeah, I'm putting my shoulder in uh, it is eight Peter you doing anything go ahead and use your shield G no nope, just preparing for it I'm going to drop this guy off for now. Okay, all right, go ahead and roll initiative, both of you. Don't forget the other one's going to come barreling in from the bottom as soon as this starts. I'm assuming. So Jack's probably going to get trampled. <laughs> he's going to be fucking pissed. <laughs> well, he's got an eye on him, and he had just, he had like half a, half a breath before mentioned, hey, don't forget that this guy's down here. <laughs> yeah. 
or that he was not looking uh, very happy about your guys' presence. It's a good try, though, baby. We almost got past him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, last time you got to ruin all you the guys plans, ruined, so Yeah, exactly. Ruin you guys ruined all my so. plans. That's how, that's how <laughs> you're going to say it. Yeah. Well, I was trying to make it nice and easy for everybody. <laughs> Did I grab the right one? Yeah, number one. There he is. Okay, cool. Uh, Sako, go ahead and roll again because you get advantage on your initiative. So let's see if you go higher than an eight. <laughs> I got an eight. <laughs> Did you not already roll, G? Oh, I guess you didn't. Okay. No. All right, no, actually, I didn't. This time. Okay, cool. All right. All right. Uh, it is Peter's turn, and there are two of these that are slightly smaller in front of you, and then one that looks much larger that is back in the uh, hallway behind. Uh, on the combat tracker, one is the big guy. Gotcha. I'm going to make a move and um, shoot my spear. Hold on a second. Your vitriolic? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, so you go rushing past. Uh, Jack is still behind you, and in fact, he gets you, you, you hear a gasp from behind you as soon as you start to run away like shit. He was going to try to lean on you, and you've gone running. Uh, so so he's, like, kind of gasped, and, is, is, and it looks like he's going to try to chase up behind you, try to get over behind uh, Kedis and Nivara. Uh, but you kind of rushed up around the corner and see the two of these creatures that are, you know, almost within reach of you. What are you doing? I'm going to cast... Vulturic Sphere. Vitriolic, um, yeah. What level is that? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to cast it at level 4 for now. What, uh, what level is it to start with? 4? Uh, 4, yeah. Okay. I'm looking for it on my sheet right now. Yeah, it's a 4th level. Guys, I'm busy right now. It's uh, 10d4, I think, by default. Uh, 10d4 and then the 5d4 on the end of its next turn. Alright. Targeting uh, is the um, It does have a angle. range. So it's splash a, damage, right? Range is one fifty and it's a twenty foot radius, so you'll need to throw it in a in a ball that won't hit you. So I guess God damn it, the projector's flickering like really bad all of a sudden. Hang on, let me see if I can fix that real quick. Give me one sec, guys. I'm still here, I'm just trying to get it to stop flickering because like it feels like that bulb's gonna blow up. And it is right above my head, so I'll probably get some little glass shards on me. Like a vitriolic sphere. Plus two damage with glass burn. I should record how this looks and show it to you guys, because it is fucking obnoxious. It's like watching a strobe light. Jesus Christ. Stop fucking flickering for a second, Jesus! I, I'm not here. Yeah, I'm gonna take a video of this just so I can show you what I'm talking about. Is it recording? I can't tell. There we go. Now it's recording. I can't zoom it out, but basically, here, I'll, uh, there. I'm gonna show you the dog in the video so that you can see that, you know, it's not the the uh, camera or anything that's looking weird. How can I send that to you guys? Anyways, all right, we'll do that later. I think I'm gonna have to turn off the projector for a minute just to get it to stop. Because like, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about, but it's just like I can't see anything. It's just like a constant strobe light. All right. Uh, so Sako is throwing out a vitriolic sphere at him. Um, shit, I don't want to take another break. Like fucking ten minutes in. All right. Let's let's. Uh, Yeah, I don't. I don't see any other way. I'm gonna have to turn the projector off. How's Sako? Like, 
four fifteen be okay? Like, do you want to do you want to take a break? That's fine. Come back. Okay, all right. No, what, we what, can what, still get a few minutes. Hopefully, after the projector yeah. cools off. So, all right, all right, guys, quick break then. Okay. Thanks, all right. What do you want? Like a uh, ten minute or so? Yeah, for just enough. Like, I'll come back and, and try the projector here in just a minute. I just gotta you know get it to stop flickering for a second. And usually, once it's you know cooled off for for a couple minutes, then it'll last for a while. So hopefully, it'll be you know a little bit. I was, was using it for prep earlier before we started. That's why it's still already. That's really bad, fine. So. Understandable. Like All if right. we, if it goes to four thir four thirty, I'm fine with that. Don't worry okay, about cool. it. Cool. All right. All right. We'll see you in a few minutes. Okay.
Jesus. Hey, I done told you to be quiet. So you be quiet. Checker is yet or not, but I'm gonna. Oh, did I grab my phone? Yeah, I did. All right. Let me see if I can send you this video while I'm giving it a second. Sound like it's on its last legs. Yeah, it's, I mean that bulb has to be going out because like it, no, I went through all the settings trying to. So basically, when it's acted up so far to this point, if I go through the the color temperatures and change it, I can usually get it to kind of kick down and it, it'll look shitty, but it'll be solid, like the picture will stay. Um, and this time it won't even do that. I went through all the settings and it wouldn't stay, like it wouldn't go back to normal. Is there an easy way? Because I can't text the video. Is there? Maybe I can do it. For can me. you do it in Discord? Do you have Discord on your phone? I do, actually. I wonder if that would work. Is that, no, there's a share button. Hang on. Yeah, those uh, projectors definitely get some flicker going uh, before my bulbs go out. It'll do like a little fast flickering, like an old 1940s movie, reel to reel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's uh, except this is also colors. Like it's like watching a fucking uh, like technical or like a rainbow thing. I just sent it to UG. Tell me if you get that. Uh, Sako, I have two numbers in here for you: six five zero and six seven eight. Which one's the right one? Six five zero eight six eight three four seven zero. Yeah, where'd right. you get that other number from? I don't know. It's just in here for you. Maybe it's my old work number from ACT. It might be. Yeah. All right, looks like it's sending now for both of you. Uh, gee, it looks like it's, you should have it now. Oh, don't. Well, I mean, you could. That's my DM screen, so you can kind of see. But there, there isn't anything special in there for you to, for you to cheat to, to see, but. Anyways, you can see what I'm talking about for the fucking flicker. Let me try turning the bastard back on now. And because I didn't stop the recording, all of this will be in the recording as well. VNC on. There we go. If I had VNC on my main machine, I could just VNC into it from the laptop and finish it up from there. That's an idea, actually. I could do that at least in the meantime. Then I would theoretically it would be a pain. Theoretically, I could control it all from one computer if I did it that way instead of two different machines and six different screens. like it's coming back on, but it still hasn't come back on. Yeah, it sounds like that thing's on its last leg. That video is unacceptable. Yeah, so you can see that? Did, ben, did you see it too? You still don't have a game. It says you have it. it. Should be in the text. Nothing on my phone yet. Yeah, that just looks real weird. That's just full artifacting, yeah, color, and everything. Yeah. It's like constantly, like it's it's rainbow color, like it's it's like flickering through all, and so like I, I pointed the camera at the dot. Well, you kind of there's still a distortion in the camera. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 
You see that? Yeah, jeez. You know, fucking obnoxious. Let me give it one more try here to get this freaking thing back on. And if it doesn't go, then we'll we'll call it a day and then uh, come back to it next week with the. Uh, I'll just either I'll have another bulb in place or or the TV by then. Try it again. I'll give it a sec here. While it is doing that, um, I guess uh, any questions or anything on like how this arc is going to work? Because I know it's a little bit complicated. Like, does it does it make sense? Everybody on the same page of how this arc will work? Yeah, everything's good. <laughs> so um, a lot of it then will be, and I went over this just briefly, but a, a lot of this arc is going to be. Um, a little bit ambiguous in that I won't have a ton of structure around for you because, for example, that this each each uh, um, cycle will be one year of time, but we're not going to play through a full year. You know what I mean? Um, so I'll, I'll ask you, you know, at the beginning of each cycle, let's say, what are you trying to get accomplished this year? Like, are you going to spend time doing this or that or whatever? Well, you know, if you say that you're going to spend time training, it doesn't mean that you spent a whole year doing push-ups. It means that, you know, you maybe that was kind of the, the, the general focus that you spent that year doing or whatever um, but it doesn't mean you can't accomplish other things too throughout that time so keep that in mind or maybe you're you know trying to spend a lot of time with Elspeth to get to know her better or whatever and all you know kind of will improv scenes like that as needed um, but you know it, it, the, the um, full narrative representation will be a little bit uh, high level in that we probably won't delve into every single little scene of course through that whole year because that wouldn't be reasonable to do um, but you'll see kind of how the each year is going to come across uh, as we go through this. And it does not seem like the projector is going to come back up. Oh, it just beeped. Hang on. And it still did not come back up. Fucking A. Alright, well, I mean, it's only a hundred dollar bowl, but it's still fucking irritating. Gotta throw that thing off the roof. Yeah, I, I kind of want to smash the whole thing with a hammer. Like, at least the, the bulb, for sure, is getting a good old hammer. But the projector I'm kind of irritated with, too. It's not the projector's fault. I just, you know, it was it was a cheap bulb anyways. Um, the You couldn't buy the ViewSonic ones anymore, uh, so I bought the third-party one. Uh, or at least you couldn't buy, on, buy them on Amazon. And the third-party one I've used once before, and it worked fine. It lasted 7,500 hours or something like that, which is not quite as much as an OEM bulb, but it still, you know, did its job and looked good. Um, but this was just another one of those and, and you know, lasted 200 hours, less than 200, um, it, which is totally not acceptable. Like, they're supposed to, they're rated to last 5,000, so if it lasts 7,500 for the last one, I thought that's good. Uh, but anyways, it looks like Amazon has the actual ViewSonic bulbs now for the same price, so I'm just going to buy one of those instead. So, Anyways, guys, sorry for the annoying uh, ending here or, or lack thereof for this week's session. Um, I actually had a, a fun ending for this week's session for you, but uh, we'll have to get to that, I guess, like the beginning or middle of next week's session instead. So um, Next week, let's see, since I still have my laptop here, next week's the 30th. Everybody good for September 30th? Yeah. Yep, should be good, yeah. All right, dudes, then I will see you then. Um, the level up maybe we'll take care of we might do that next uh, next week um just to to get it done uh but we'll bump you up to 18 and then you'll be 18 throughout the the last arc here and then you'll be 20 for the for the kind of remainder of it um but we probably have like i told you before we probably have about another six to eight weeks or so of, of balance um and then we'll be we'll be done with this campaign. Um, also, remember when I mentioned a long time ago too, by the way, that this one because of uh, how I had had this this last part built in, there would be room to do one shots if you guys wanted to play these characters later on or whatever. Uh, that will be these, so you'll be able to kind of you know we'll be able to do one shots in here if you want to, just you know for a one off week or something like that. Like if I don't have something prepared for the other campaign, we'll be able to switch back to this one just to do something fun and still play these characters if you wanted to. So cool. Yep. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, uh, have a good afternoon, and I'll see you guys next week. Sounds right. good. Yep. See you.
Nice. 